and then we'll continue through chapter 12 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 11, beginning at verse 27. If you found it, will you say amen? amen. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the fa father of Eschah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the word of the Lord, and somebody ought to say amen. My hope is built on Then I dare not trust, dare not trust on Jesus, on Christ. And he shall come with righteousness and with trumpet sound. He shall come with trumpet sound. sound. Oh, in him be found. to stand all other ground
Amen. Repeat after me. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. I want to begin today a series of sermons generally titled Reclaiming the Family. Reclaiming the Family. When you think about it, our earliest experiences in life took place within the context and boundaries of a family. Go back through the tunnel of your memory as far as you can. Go back. Before you were an adult, before you were a young adult, if you can remember that, before you were a teenager, before you were an adolescent, think about the very beginnings of your life. Before the job where you now work or used to work, go back. Before the church where you first worshiped and met the Lord, keep going back. Before the elementary school you first attended, there was a family into which you and I were born. Hopefully, it was a loving family, but maybe not. Perhaps mother and father raised you, but maybe not. Whatever the structure and whatever the circumstance, somewhere back there was a family. A family with members related either by blood or by marriage or both. Families consisting perhaps of stepmothers, stepfathers, stepchildren, blended, what we call, or not blended. Maybe you were raised in a family with brothers and sisters, or maybe you were the only child. Whatever the case, we came into God's world within the context and boundaries of a family structure. And then we grew up. And either we left that family nest or we were pushed out or, or kicked out, whatever the case, we, we, we left that family, and sociologists call it the family of procreation. And we found ourselves in another family, which sociologists call the family of orientation. So we left a home where we were sons and daughters, and and made ourselves a family where we had sons and daughters, or perhaps no children at all, perhaps 
you married and raised children. Those children now have children, and their children's children have children. But all along the journey, we have not escaped family. From birth to death, we are, for better or worse, connected in some way to family. And you know, television executives uh, know well this reality because over the years we have seen many TV families. And for the more seasoned within the congregation, you may remember Father Knows Best. Leave it to Beaver, the Partridge family, my three sons, and later all in the family, and still later the family of good times with JJ, also known for his familiar cry, Dynamite, and then family matters. And the Huxtables, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, and on and on and on, because television executives know the power and popularity of the family. And, and some of those TV families were, were, I guess, too perfect squeaky clean, and, and others were dysfunctional and uh, flawed and anything but perfect. But the presence of those families underlined the importance of the family in our culture and in our growth and development as human beings. Now, I'm tempted. Uh, always now at this point in my life to turn back the clock for a moment and remind many of us of what family was like in days gone by, knowing full well that though we can reminisce about the past, we can never return to the past. But I speak of families once upon a time consisting of a father and a mother who were married. I know that's kind of new today, but yeah, they, they were married, if you can believe it, and, and, and they had children, and they lived together married in the same house, and, and how families would eat meals together. For it was at the dinner table where families shared conversation with one another. There was no Boston market, no fast food stores, no Taco Bells, no Chick-fil-A's, no Whoppers, and no Big Macs. Then family members spent more time with each other. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and even if they watched television, they watched together because there was only one television. <laughs> Black and white. And so we shared, and, and in those times past, and I'm going somewhere with this, but in those times past, the kitchen and the front porch were the most important places in the house. In those days, grace was said before meals, no matter what was on the table. In those days, we shopped at the neighborhood store. We went down to the corner and got bread and milk and butter 
and sugar. In those days, neighbors knew neighbors. In those days, it didn't take much to make children happy when there was no technology. And if I can share, one of my biggest thrills as a child was just going for a ride in the car. And since we lived, grew up in Newark, 15 miles from New York, what a thrill it was for daddy to get in the car with the children in the back seat and take a ride through the Holland Tunnel and look for that sign in the middle of the tunnel that said New York one side, New Jersey on the other side and ride the bright lit, lit streets of Manhattan down Broadway and then go home. <laughs> oh, what a thrill that was. <laughs> Just to ride over to New York, but as tempting as that may be, um, I don't want to take us back there. It's just tempting to do so, so I won't go back. Um, I, I won't go back. I won't go back to yo-yos and just, just, simple, just simple pleasures. I didn't, didn't need a whole lot, just a yo-yo and, and a spinning top. And, uh, and, and some jacks. But, but I'm not going to go back there. I'm not, go, I'm not, go, I'm not going to go back to hopscotch and, and, and double dutch and the ice cream man on a bicycle. I'm, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to the, to the milkman delivering milk and the ice truck delivering ice and the coal truck delivering coal. I'm not going back. I'm not, I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to go back. But whether our experiences growing up were good or bad, our greatest memories and our greatest influences and the most meaningful moments in our lives have come within the boundaries and the context of a family. Thank God we weren't born alone. No mother, no father, no, no cousins, no brothers and no sisters, no aunts and no uncles. And even now, you know what the experts tell us? They tell us that more important than the influence of movie stars, more important than the influence of entertainers and even athletes, in the lives of our children, more important than all of that is the influence of parents. And it is not just the influence of what parents and other adults say to children, but what they do around them, not just what children hear but what children see, and so there was a time when there were certain things parents did not say and did not do around their children because they knew how easily children are influenced. But what we must understand today is that the influence of the family is not something new. The Bible is a book about families, beginning with the first family, Adam and Eve, and their sons Cain, and who else? Abel, and later Seth. Didn't know that, did you? There's another son. But the family I want to talk about today and in the Sundays ahead probably lived 4,000 years ago. Can you imagine 4,000, 2,000 years before Christ? 
His name is Abraham. But we first meet him in scripture when he is called Abram. Not Abraham, but we meet him when he is called Abram. His, his name is found in a long list of names called genealogies. And you remember when we read the scripture, we didn't start at Genesis 12 and 3. We had to go back to Genesis 11 because genealogy is that stuff in the Bible that, that makes us scratch our heads because it, it's that so-and-so begat so-and-so. And, and, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And so-and-so -and -so lived so many years and married and had children and died at, at the age of 200 and something and so-and-so and -so begat so-and-so. That's called a geneal genealogy. And the Bible is big on genealogies. Go to the first chapter of Luke, there's a genealogy. Go to the first chapter of Matthew, there's a genealogy. Go back to the book of, of Genesis and to the book of Kings and Chronicles. All of these genealogies, as boring as they are, especially when you try to pronounce the names. But you know, some of the names in the Bible may be easier to pronounce than some names we give our children. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But as, as unimportant as those genealogies are to us, they were extremely important to the authors of the Bible. Why? Because they're in the Bible for a reason. Whatever was put in the Bible was put there by God in order to teach us something. Pastor, what in the world can we learn from these long lists of men and women whose names we cannot pronounce and so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so, so what? But before we can read about Abram, we got to read about his father, Terah, who lived 205 years, and his father, Nahor, who lived 119 years, and, and we could go on and on. You know what the point is? The point is that Abram didn't just pop up out of nowhere or show up from outer space. He came from somewhere, from someone. And even if nobody came after him, and they did, somebody was ahead of him in line. When we were in grammar school, I can remember, I don't know if the children do this today, but when we would play in the playground and get ready to go back in school, we had to line up. Do, do y'all still do? Do they still? Uh, we couldn't, we couldn't just, just take off and run into the school any kind of way. We had to, we had, and usually it was size places or something like that, but we had to line, we had to line up. Well, my, my point is that, that, that when we look at our ancestry, when, when we look at where Abraham came from, he was not first in line. He was in the line, but somebody came before him. You know, some, some folks think that, that they started the line, and, and that they invented the line. No, brother, sister, there, there was somebody ahead of you in line, somebody ahead of them, somebody begat somebody, and, 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 and somebody begat Somebody, you get the picture, you're in line, but you're not first in line. In fact, you wouldn't even be in line had somebody else not been in line ahead of you. Each of us comes from somewhere. 
And each of us comes from somebody. And we come from somebody because God is trying to take us from somewhere to his where we come from in order to go to. And you can't go to if you don't know where you came from. And so, so and so begat so and so, and so and so begat so and so, and had it not for been for the begats. Don't, don't, don't get too puffed up because of your little education and your achievements. And God knows I, I love education and want us to get as much as we can. Doesn't matter how old you are, you can go back and get more because you, you would have nothing and you wouldn't be anything without those who were ahead of us in line. Am I talking to somebody today? We, we would be nothing without somebody who was ahead of us in line. So don't get it twisted. Is that the, the new thing now? Yeah, that, yeah don't, don't, don't get it twisted. Some, somewhere in your line may be someone who could not read, could not write, could not spell somebody in your line who had to work hard, some slaves in your line, but they kept the line going until you got here. How dare you blow it? How dare you embarrass your line? Even if you're not proud of some who are in your line, then you ought to live so that those who follow you in line can be proud of you. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Abram owes something to Terah. Terah owes something to Nahar. And, and keep going back up the line. Even Noah is in Abram's line. And the writer of Genesis and other biblical writers want us to understand that for better or for worse, we're connected to a family line. You may not like your family but you can't deny your family. And the Bible opens the first couple of chapters in Genesis opens with the context of the family. Adam and Eve, as I said earlier, Cain, Abel, Seth, that's a family. On every page is family. Nahar begat Terah. Terah begat Abram, and we could not talk about Abram without talking about the line. And we know little of anything about the names on those genealogical, genealogical lists until we get to Abram. Chapter 12, brothers and sisters, is the beginning of something exciting. It's the beginning of something God is getting ready to do, but he couldn't do it without Abram's daddy and his granddaddy and his mama and his grandmama. And it is not just about fathers, but mothers also, because there could be no fathers without mothers. And so even though we may read of Abram's birth at the end of chapter 11, but we read of Abraham's call in chapter 12, that's when God gets ready to do something exciting in Abram's life. You know, brothers and sisters, if nothing else, life ought to be 
exciting. You don't need money for your life to be exciting, even though you think you do. You can have money and live a boring life. But, but if nothing else, life ought to be exciting and you ought to be an exciting person to be around. If you have no money, you can lead an exciting life. Life ought not be boring. Relationships may be bad, but shouldn't be boring. I just said something. Life is an adventure. Life is a journey. And, 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 and that's what God is getting ready to say to Abram. Abram, I want you to go with me somewhere, and I'm not going to tell you where we're going. And you can't use your GPS. Wow. I see where you're going, Doc. I want you to go somewhere with me, uh-huh. and I'm not going to tell you where we're going. I, 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 I got to say that a third time because somebody, I'm, I want you to go somewhere. God is talking to Abram. I want you to go somewhere. He, he never said it to anybody ahead of Abram. But when he gets to chapter 12 and Abram, Abram, I want you to go with me somewhere and I'm not going to tell you where you're going. I want you to trust me. I want you to let me take you by your hand and lead you on an exciting journey, an adventure of faith. My brothers and my sisters, are you ready for the journey? Because life is a journey and God is trying to take us somewhere. Will you go? One of the things that makes life exciting and relationships exciting, and again, you, you know, we think we got to have money for everything. <laughs> got to have money to have a good time. And we go around you know, bragging about how many places we've been in the world and, and all of that and the kind of houses we live in and ain't no joy in our lives at all, no excitement. We're just living from day to day, uh, prioritizing the wrong things in life. But you can have excitement in your life if you don't have a dime. And one of the things that makes life exciting you know, y'all, y'all even look exciting right now. I want you to know that. Eh? One of the things that, that makes life exciting and relationships exciting, because, because one of the problems is that we got to know everything about the journey. And we got these little gadgets. I left my cell phone upstairs, but we got these, ga- you know, we can, we, we go places. Right. And it maps it out for us, tells us what time we're going to get there. You know, tells us how many miles. Everything, one of the exciting things about the journey of life is that you ain't got to know everything. But, but to trust God because he knows everything. Why, why do I need to know everything if, if he knows everything? Because if we, knew, if we knew the trouble that was down the road, we would spend all of our time now worried about the trouble down the road. And we could not enjoy the moment, the time that God has given to us. We would spend all of our time worrying. I don't want to know everything about everybody. 
Come on, somebody. Now, I don't want to know everything about my wife. I want to discover because marriage is not knowing everything about your partner because there's some stuff you don't need to know. Amen, somebody. But every day I want to discover something about this woman that I didn't know before so that forever is not long enough. I, I want the excitement of, dis of discovery. And you see, brothers, let me say something to these young folk uh, and some of the young women. You ain't got to put all you got out there too soon. Hey, hey. I mean, you ought to hide some of it. Okay, all right. I'm, I mean, I mean, hey, how you doing? My name is so-and-so. Let's go to bed. Did I shock you? Good. There's some things that ought to remain hidden. There's some things you ought to want to discover about a person every day, discovering more. You don't need to know everything about somebody. If you do, where is the excitement? You know, so c cover up your body. You know, don't show all your tattoos and, you know, especially if everybody's seen them. All right, all right, let me go, let me go on. This is, this is what you're in for in this series, though. See, you see, there's a discovery because the more we discover, the more excitement when it comes to life and I walk with the Lord, I don't want to know everything. I want to trust that God who knows everything for he knows even my down sitting and my up rising and when you go into a relationship a new relationship you ain't got to tell all your business all of your past you don't want to be loved for what you did in the past you want to be loved for where you are now. Listen, sisters, he doesn't need to know everything. And you don't need to know everything. The song says, yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus. Well, I, I got another song, yesterday's gone, thank you, Jesus. Leave those closet doors shut. You start opening closet doors and you don't know what's going to fall out. And remember, you've got some closets too that you don't want anybody else opening. Somebody said he start shaking his family tree and all the nuts fell out. When, 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 we, when we get to chapter 12, when, when we get to chapter 12, God invites Abraham, I'm through now, to take a journey with him. Abraham, come with me. Where are we going? I'm not telling you where we're going. Give me a hint. No, no hints. Just go with me to a place you don't know about. And I got to stop now, but God makes a promise to Abram. I will bless them that bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And because of you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It is important for us to know as I close who's on the journey with us. 
It's important for us to know. See, a whole lot of Christians live their life on the journey as if nobody's on the journey with them. And that's why they walk around sad and mad all the time and complaining about everything. You know there's some people who will complain about everything. Nothing ever goes right. You can know them for 50 years. They've never said anything encouraging to you. They never said anything that can lift up your spirit. They never said anything that can help you and encourage you and make you feel good. Everything is negative. Every, everything is complaining. Everything is whining and sighing and and, and everything is, is, is negative, but here you've got to know who's on the journey with you. In fact, the one who invites us to make the journey is the one who is with us on the journey. Because sometimes somebody can invite you to go somewhere with them, and at the last minute they can't go. Amen, somebody. Come, let's, let's go on a trip, but at the last minute, they can't go. Let's go to the mall, but at the last minute, something has come up, and I can't go. But here, the one who invites us to go on the journey is with us on the journey every step of the way. If you go on the journey, you better make sure that the Lord is on the journey with you because there are potholes in the road and you know the danger of the pothole is you can't see it until you hit it I know I've been there you've been there you can't see it there the reason we need him on the road because there's some rough places on the road there's some mountains and hills and valleys on the road and sometimes the way will get dark and the, and, and the way will get dreary, but if Jesus is on the road with you, you'll be all right. Can I get a witness? If you go on this exciting journey, make sure Jesus is with you every step of the way. And may the Lord bless you today. Reclaiming the family, I will bless you those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and because of you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham, Abram rather, put your name where Abram is. I want you to go with me on a journey that you don't know where you're going, but I promise you that I'll be with you every step of the way. And you know the problem, brothers and sisters, is too many of us want insurance but not assurance. You won't get an insurance policy, but you'll get assurance, blessed assurance, that I am with you every step of the way. The door of the church is open today. There may be someone here today and you do not know Christ in the pardon of your sins. And the Bible says if you're like that, you're, you're on the outside looking in. You need to make a commitment to him on this journey. The question is not whether you're on a journey. The question is who's with you. And you want the assurance that, that God through Christ is with you every step of the way. And so the invitation is extended, number one, for those who need to accept Christ as Savior and make him the Lord of your life. But number two, you've already done that, but you have slid away. You have fallen away from the church and from the will of God and you need to come back and say I've, I've fallen away I need to be in the church I need to have a pastor in my life I need spiritual guidance and you need to make that decision as well the door of the church is open the choir will lead us in song and if there is one who will come today 
Get up out of your seat. Don't worry about who's looking at you. Don't worry about what folks going to say because there's something to say about them too. Just come on and give God your heart and give God your life. The door of the church is open and the invitation is extended. Won't you come?